Right, okay, this is going to be an impromptu session about, about inclusive design. That I even managed to colour match my outfit to the slides again! Yes. There was a train here. Okay, uh, I'm also going to get my phone out because I... Can I set my phone so I can see how long we're going? Because this is going to run a little bit short. That's fine. Okay, so... Um, this is a talk about a principle in inclusive design called the curb cut effect. It's a way we can think about inclusive design. It gives us a new way to approach designs and hopefully I find quite a useful thing to think about. So a little bit of context. I work at a museum called Welcome Collection, which is a museum in London. We think about, we challenge people, the way people think about human health and medicine. So earlier this year we did a session all about living with buildings, about the effects of architecture on human health. And so as part of this, and so when we were doing this gallery, I started thinking about are there ways that design might affect inclusion? So we can imagine, for example, there are architectural structures of exclusion, something like a wall or a door or a fence. Are there ways we can design architecture for inclusion? And so this takes me naturally to something that I'm sure many of you have seen around. These ramped areas where the curb, where the pavement dips, the curb drops, and somebody's able to seamlessly transition from the road to the pavement. In this country, we call them dropped curbs, uh, but because the entire world runs on American English, the term that's often also used is curb cuts and that's the term, term used in the title of this talk. In what is probably the only instance of an American spelling that actually adds the letter U. <laughs> <laughs> so where do curb cuts come from? Um, there are stories of simultaneous invention, lots of people came up with the idea around the same time, but one of my favorite stories comes from a place in America called Kalamazoo in Michigan. There was a lawyer in Kalamazoo called Jack Fisher. Uh, he was training at Harvard Law School, but unfortunately, this was in the 1940s, this was in the 1930s, so towards the end of the decade, World War II broke out, and that kind of distracted from his medical studies. He was injured during the war, and ended up after the war, after he was discharged, he went to a medical hospital in Battle Creek to deal with his below-the-knee injuries that he'd suffered as the result of an explosion. And because he was a lawyer, and lawyers tend to get bored and want things to read, while he was sitting in the hospital ward, he read all the other patient notes. Because 1940s privacy laws. But this made, meant he was quite knowledgeable, he understood some of the challenges faced by below the knee amputees, people with injuries suffered during the war. So when he returned to his native town of Kalamazoo, he tried to establish himself as a lawyer in another law firm, but they took one look at him as a disabled veteran and decided they weren't going to hire him which they could decide to do because 1940s hiring laws. <laughs> so he did, so he instead, he being this fairly, you know, hotshot Harvard lawyer, very knowledgeable, very understanding of the challenges faced by a lot of the residents of Kalamazoo, given that a lot of them had come from the hospital, the military hospital of Battle Creek, he decided that what he was going to do was, was set up his own law firm and start representing these people in the streets of Michigan. These disabled veterans who couldn't get jobs, who couldn't get social act, weren't, couldn't get social recognition. And one of the things he noticed in Kalamazoo was that getting around was extremely difficult because Kalamazoo had very high curbs. Typically curbs in Kalamazoo were anywhere up to six inches, which is tall even at the best of times, but if, you're, if you've are you got some sort of below the leg amputation or a leg injury, that's basically impossible to get around. People would trip, they would damage their crutches. If you're on a wheelchair, and if you're on a manual wheelchair of the 1940s, crossing a six inch gap is next to impossible. So he petitioned the city that maybe they could try installing these ramps. Uh, here, here we have the curbs, and then he petitioned the city to try installing these ramps that would allow people to seamlessly transition from the pavement to the road. And this was one of the early examples of a curb cut. And you'll see here as well in the early examples, they actually featured handrails to help people getting up and down from the pavement, but a lot of these were people who didn't have very much strength in their legs, but might still have fairly well-functioning upper arm strength. And so the city installed these, and they thought they'd try it for a while, and what they discovered is that they were very popular, and they eventually got rolled out across the, across the entire city, and later became, um, later became popular across the United States, and of course the very ubiquitous feature of roads that we see today. But when they did this, the city discovered something interesting. Obviously, curb cuts make the roads more accessible for wheelchair users and disabled people. It gives them that seamless transition from road to pavement. But they're not the only people who benefit. 
You can also make use of a curb cut if you're if you've got if you're a parent with a push chair, if you've got a wheeled suitcase, if you've just got some sort of temporary leg injury because you've broken your leg. Um, often, often, often very useful for people with el for more elderly people who perhaps have other difficulty climbing high steps. So this design that was ostensibly intended to help disabled people actually ends up having a much wider benefit. And this is the idea of the curb cut effect. Making something better for disabled people can make it better for everyone. Just because something was originally designed with a disability, with disability accommodation in mind doesn't mean it won't have other benefits elsewhere. And we end up seeing this in quite a lot of other places. So let's look at a few more examples. Oh, yes, sorry. I haven't looked at these slides in six months, so I don't remember quite what they all say. Um, what this means for us as people who design things, who build things as both developers and designers, is that if we design our things to include disabled people, to think about them from the start, we end up with better designs for everybody. It's not something we want to go ahead and tack on later. It's something that can actually make a big positive difference right from the start and has a much better benefit as a result. So that's the curve cut effect. So hopefully there are some examples here. Yes, right, okay, the first example. Uh, anybody know who this is? So this is the Countess Contessa di Fivis Fivisano. I forget the name, I apologize. And she is blind, she was blind. Uh, 18th century Countess, I think. She's blind, but she wants to send love letters. She wants to send letters to her lover, who was an Italian inventor. And the problem is that if you're blind in the 18th century, the only way you can write is to dictate your letters to somebody else and have them write them for you. And obviously for most people, the idea of the idea of dictating your love letters to another person before you send them is not something that's particularly appealing. So her lover, the inventor whose name I apologize I've forgotten, ended up creating a machine that would allow her to write by pressing sequences of cap by pressing buttons that would type letters onto the page. A sort of machine for writing with type. I wonder if we could come up with a better name for it. But of course, we're not all blind women who are writing love letters to our lover. At least I don't think so. I don't want to, obviously, you know, we have a wide audience here, but that's not what the majority of us use keyboards for. But this design for the keyboard, this early, this is the earliest working design of the keyboard, is basically the way we all interact with the computer today. How many keyboards are there literally in the room with us right now? So this design that was originally intended to help one blind woman send love letters actually ended up becoming the cornerstone of the way we interact with modern computers. Now let's move to something that gets the heart racing almost as much as love letters. I can't remember why that side is there. Apologies, right? <laughs> Probably something about being the foundation of the computer. I can't remember. I apologize. Okay. Try to take two. Something that gets our heart racing as much of love as love letters. Email! <laughs> I'm not feeling the energy in the room for emails. It's not something you're all excited about. Only One person! <laughs> only if it's SMTP UTF-8. I'm going to pretend I understand what that means. Okay, um, so one of the people, so where does email come from? Because I think email is, some, email is something, you know, that's fairly ubiquitous today, but actually a lot of the only work on email was done by this man. Uh, anybody recognize him? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then you can tell us who he is. Is it Vince Cerf? Correct! Ten points to Kirk. <laughs> so this is Vince Cerf who did a lot of the early work on the internet and was one of the early advocates for email. Uh, so why did he push this so much? Well, Vince Cerf, along with his wife, are both deaf. So he said, because I'm hearing impaired, Emails are a tremendously valuable tool because of the precision that you get. I can read what's typed as opposing to strain to hear what's being he to hear what's being said. Because at the time, the only other way you could communicate with somebody if they weren't in the other room was with the telephone. But if you can't, if hearing is, is difficult for you or or draining, a telephone is no good. So he he pushed email in part because it would enable him to better communicate with his wife. But of course, this thing that he was pushing, you know very much because this benefit for him actually ended up being this incredibly ubiquitous tool that would enable people to communicate across the world, you know, millions of emails sent every day. It gave us a new way to do remote communication. So email is another example. Now another example of this, and perhaps what, what another sort of very famous example is of course closed captioning. 
closed captioning was introduced, I want to say, in the 1980s on American television. It was on very few channels. You had to get specialist equipment to use it. Today, of course, today captioning is much more ubiquitous. The vast majority of television content is captioned. YouTube supports captioning. And in fact, on YouTube these days, even if the up creators have uploaded captions, they will automatically generate captions for you. Now, captions are still really useful if you're deaf or hard of hearing. They're still really, they're still a really useful accommodation for you. But captions are helpful for a lot of other people, lots of other people as well, in lots of other environments. Maybe you're in a very noisy environment, like a bar, and you can't hear what the television is saying. Maybe you're in a very quiet environment with a sleeping child, and you can't turn the volume up. Or maybe you're with one of those monsters who thinks it's acceptable to talk during films. <laughs> Captions have a much wider audience and bring benefits to many more people than they were originally intended for. And as I hope some of you have been witnessing this week, uh, that also applies at conferences. Cap live captioning conferences, Daniela has talked about this in the introductory sessions, is a thing that we originally brought in at this conference for the benefit of people who are hard of hearing. And in the however many years we've been organized, we've been running it, I don't think a single hard of hearing person has ever come to us and said, hey, I really appreciated having the captions in the room. Doesn't mean they didn't, of course, they just never told us. But we have had so many people come to us and say, I'm hard of hearing, I'm not hard of hearing, but I really benefited from having the captions. Whether it's because they lapsed in concentration, or they didn't quite catch what the speaker was saying. Obviously, if you're somebody who is listening to a session that is given in something that is not your first language, as we do have many international attendees, that's very useful for them. Or maybe you've got distracted and you're checking Twitter during the talk and you missed what the speaker said. So live captioning conferences is another example. And again, there's one of our captioners from, I want to say, judging by the website design on that iPad, I think that's the two years ago, but I can't be sure. <laughs> and in fact, that person may be in the other room captioning right now, for all I know. So live captioning conferences is another one. Uh, another big, good example, fun example that I like is optical character recognition, or OCR, machine read, the ability for machines to read printed text. And again, this is something that we largely take for granted today, but actually had to be invented. And one of the earliest examples of OCR is this machine. This is a machine called an optophone, and it was created to help blind people read. What you would do is you would place your piece of paper with printed text on the flatbed scan here. The camera would then read the text and convert it into a series of audible pulses, similar to Morse code, and play it through the headphones for you. Uh, which is in some ways sort of, you know, it's sort of extracting text from a printed document, which I'm going to claim is a tenuous link to reading text from PDFs, which is what this session was obviously originally about. <laughs> but of course, OCR has lots of applications for people outside helping blind people to read. It's used for computer vision, it's used for all sorts of machine learning and data analysis when we're dealing with scanned images. And a lot of the work that went into creating synthetic voices was also done for this sort of work. Creating audible pulses are nice, but a lot of early work into creating sort of computer synthesized voices, things like that became Siri and Alexa, started in the technology that was helping blind people to read using this audible technology. So that's another case where sort of a technology that was originally developed for a very small group of people ended up having a massively outsized benefit. And this is something I work on at Welcome. Uh, so some of you, most of, I imagine some of you came to my session yesterday, so you've already heard the joke about data centers and container technology. So I should skip that. But basically, right, we have a big building full of books. Did you not hear the joke yesterday? Oh, well, for the benefit of you then. So, okay, I work at Welcome Collection. This is our archive. This, we hold a large archive about the history of human health and medicine, and this is one of our data centers. <laughs> where we run advanced container technology such as shelves and <laughs> books. But you'll notice these books are very fragile, we don't really want to get them out too much, so to help researchers, we digitize the book. We take high quality photographs of them, and then we put them on the internet. Problem is, of course, we have a lot of books, and it's not so useful if we just have the images of those books and you don't actually know what they contain. So one of the things we can do using this OCR technology is we can scan all the text in the books and we can tell you what the books contain so you can do a full text search. So this is the Diaries of Mary Curie when she was writing about radioactivity. You can't actually see the original in this book because it's slightly radioactive. But you'll see we can scan the text, we can even identify exactly where on the page the words radioactive occurs. And again, that's something we wouldn't be able to do without the benefits of OCR. I'm going to skip this example because I'm running out of time. 
So, that is the curb cut thing. Making something better for disabled people can make it better for everyone. But it's not just about disability. There are other examples where making a design more inclusive for certain groups of people can have outsized benefits. One of the examples I like to think about um, a lot, being somebody who has to get commute on a train every day, lots of the world does not have half high bandwidth internet. Okay, we're very lucky in this country, broadband is readily available, most of us can afford you know, some sort of fiber or very fast connection to our homes, and certainly not home out in our offices. But there are large parts of the world where that's not true. And I'm not just talking about places like rural Africa, rural, rural areas, but also you know, large parts of the UK do not have fast internet. I think something like 20% of the US can't even buy broadband, no matter how much money they throw at it. So if we are being responsible developers, we might think, well, I want my product to be able to be used by these people, because from a very selfish point of view, the faster a page loads, the more likely somebody is to stay on it, and if they stay on that page, they will spend more money. But of course, making something better for people on a low bandwidth connection doesn't just help those people who have that permanently, it also helps people who are on a train going through a tunnel, they've got a low mobile signal, or they're using hotel Wi-Fi. Not that I imagine any of you would know anything about that. <laughs> so really, if I skip ahead a couple of slides, yeah, so the idea of the real curb cut effect is not just about disability, it's this idea that making something better for people who are excluded or marginalised can make it better for everyone. Making something better for people who are excluded or marginalised can make it better for everyone. So, why do I talk about this? Why is this a fun presentation to do? Why did I have slides about this just prepared on my laptop ready to go? And there are two reasons. One is I think these are good stories. These are fun stories. These are stories that we can share with people. And when I was writing this presentation, I had a lot of fun just sort of reading all about it and finding the things I didn't get to talk about. And I got to go to all my friends and say, hey, have you heard this really cool story about how the bendy straw was invented? And, you know, that gets people thinking, gets people talking, it's a conversation opener. Because often when I talk about diversity and inclusion, I think people's eyes start to glaze over. They assume I'm going to get preachy, they assume I'm going to talk about privilege and unconscious bias, and those are important things to talk about, but people don't tend to be that interested when you, when you start using those words. But if I talk about, oh, did you know how the curb cut was invented, or where email comes from, or the history of OCR, people tend to be a bit more interested in that. It helps hold people's interest. So I think, and that's, I think, a really useful tool to have. The other more serious point is that, okay, so we are hopefully all good people. We are all good people. Yeah. <laughs> you had me worried there for a second. Okay, so we all know, right, that inclusion is a good thing to do. We should design our products and services to be inclusive because it's the right thing to do. And the problem is, of course, right, that things don't happen if they're just because they're fair or right. Imagine what a different world that would be. So, we often have to make a business case for doing it. We have to justify the value of inclusive design of changing our product to make it more inclusive. And the question you often get asked is things like, well, how many people is this really going to benefit? Can we really afford to do this? You know, is it really going to matter? And using something like the Coke Cut Effect where you can say, well, yes, we think we're helping this small group of people, but actually it's going to help a much wider group of people, can help justify that investment to the bean counters. It can help show them that actually you're not helping this tiny, one narrow section of the population. You're going to make things better for, you, for much more of your use base. So, yeah, I know I'm nearly done. So, yeah, so that's, and that's the other useful thing about it. And it helps dispel this myth that inclusion is, is a trade-off, that by helping one group, we hurt the other. Because actually, no we can help lots of groups all at once. So, that is the curb cut effect. Making something better for people who are excluded or marginalised can make it better for everyone. Uh, I do actually have slides. I'm not on the third floor, obviously, this is for my work presentation, but I'm happy to come and talk about it further if you'd like to around the rest of the conference. Thank you for listening. <laughs>